So, um, so by tackling diseases, you have to tackle the causes of diseases first. And of course, there are many different causes of diseases, and many of these are spanned by different units of the MRC. Infection, if you get an infectious disease, like a cold, the flu, viruses, parasites, this will cause, this will cause a disease characteristic and you'll get poorly. There are the purely environmental, if you, um, chemical, if you get poisoned, if you, there's a radiation damage, and a purely chemical aspect, an environmental aspect to, to a disease. But what we're going to talk about today is genetic disease. So the diseases that are caused by changes in your DNA. DNA, of course, is the inherited material that you get from your mum and dad and that, that guides the characteristics of, of how you're made up as a human. And it's changes in this DNA which can result in disease. And actually quite a high proportion of diseases are, are due to genetic, uh, have some genetic component. Either the genes are a direct cause of the disease or the genes or the combination of your genes make you more susceptible to different types of disease. And this is some figures from the Genetic Alliance in the UK um, who, who make this estimate that, that 13,000 births in the UK a year are affected by a congenital disorder. So how do we study genetic disease? You can look in the population for a, for a common gene or a common type of gene that the sufferers share. And of course the easiest way of doing this is in family studies who are, mo who are most genetically alike from each other. Or in recent years there's been this, this huge, and Paul will talk about this a little bit later on, but there's been this huge burst in something called genome-wide association studies. And these are massive, these are tens of thousands of, of humans that have been recruited into these mass studies to look for common genes in people that are susceptible to things like obesity, diabetes. One of the drawbacks in using humans in these massive genetic studies is that, is that as, as individuals, we are all combinations, a mass combination of many different genes, but obviously these different combinations of genes make the analysis much more, much more complicated. And so basically, in studying human disease, we've got a problem with just using the human gene pool because of these many different combinations and these many different environmental effects. So kind of where did, where did sort of human genetic analysis, mammalian genetic analysis, go next? Well, there were two big kind of revolutions in the last few years. One of them's been with the Human Genome Project, and this was a complete sequencing of the human genome. So we now know the codes for 20,000 plus genes in the human genome. Unfortunately, we don't know what all of them do, and, uh, and um, we don't know what quite a big majority of them do, and we don't know what, which variations of them cause diseases in some cases. So the other big revolution has been the use of a mouse as a model organism for looking at genetics and for looking at what these genes do, what human genes do and what the mouse version of those genes do. And there's really three things that I want to tell you about that are the basis of where Paul's going to come and give you an active example of the research we do. And there are really three major things that make, that make mice really key, in a technical term, really key to being a model organism. The first of them is, is that we're able to produce... Um, groups of mice that are genetically identical. And in doing this, this is really important. If you have a genetically identical set of mice and you alter one gene and you see a characteristic, you know that characteristic is because of that one gene that's being altered, not because they've been brought up differently, not because they've got a different combination of genes in their background, not because they've eaten different things and not because they've had a different infection. During the process of the last 100 years where, where mouse genetics has, has really come to the forefront in biological research, during this time there have been a number of genetic variants that have come up. So during, in, during the selective breeding there have been a number of, of animals that have arisen that haven't looked like their parents and we've been able to look at what mutation has occurred in them and what variation has occurred in them and, uh, and track the cause of the disease or the characteristic that they're showing. But really the big revolution has been since the 1980s in, in genetic engineering when, where the mouse genome, we've been able to actively modify and manipulate the mouse genome to actively change genes that we select ourselves. All of the mice in laboratories in the whole of the world come actually from, from um, three species and a, and a, and a, and a subspecies. Um, uh, and all of them are derived as a combination of these. And actually all of the animals in, in laboratories at the moment are derived purely from uh, the fancy mice, or the people who kept pet mice. And, uh, and um, this lady called Abby Lathrop in Illinois um, at the turn of the, uh, the, turn of the um, 20th century, she, was, she supplied these fancy mice to pet shops. And she got talking to some people in laboratories and was really started breeding for laboratory purposes. And she's kind of seen as, as the forerunner of a lot of the of laboratory mouse strains. 
And what came of the work she did and the work that somebody called Clarence Little did in, in the States, in the States at the sort of 1910 onwards, was that they produced these things called inbred strains. And, and at the moment, there's about 520, but it, it goes up every year, different strains of mice that are described as being inbred. And these are strains that are genetically identical. So every mouse in that, in that family is exactly the same. So, so they're like identical twins. And that allows us to manipulate single or, or multiple genes, but on a background where everything is exactly the same. So it's not a sort of confusing background that you would have with some of the human studies. On top of that, during this 100 years of, of, of fairly intensive mouse breeding, many mouse variants have arisen spontaneously. And this occurs in the human population as well. Somebody's DNA will mutate spontaneously, um, either, either because of a normal biological process that's gone wrong or as, or as a result of, you know, in humans, as a result of sort of radiation damage and, and chemical damage. But these have been used quite widely in research. And the sort of thing they, they've been used for are things like congenital deafness. And, and you know, this was, there was a mouse strain that was noticed that it nodded its head. And when they cloned the gene, they found out that it was one of the genes that's really important for your vestibular balance in your ear. Which, which meant that they could, they could clone and that they, there's a lot of work being done on congenital deafness on the back of this, of this gene. But also some of the diabetes and obesity mice, that, you know, mice that, that spontaneously became very fat and we've managed to clone some of the important genes that were involved in people getting extremely fat. But really the revolution and the revolution at, at, at Harwell and at, at the Sanger and at a number of places in the UK and especially throughout the world has been the ability to genetically engineer mice. And this really has come from the ability to manipulate um, pre-implantation embryos. And so these are embryos that, these are fertilised embryos from a mouse that are, that are two and a half days into gestation. So they haven't yet, they haven't yet implanted into the uterus. They're, they're, before that stage, they're four to eight cells. But basically, um, embryos, anything up to, um, up to three and a half or four days can, can be manipulated genetically. And so we can alter, at a very early stage of development, we can alter the DNA. And in the 1980s, there was the beginning of this whole genetic revolution in making transgenic mice. And there's a number of ways, and there's a number of different techniques in modifying mice genetically. And one of them is that you can add information to them. And actually, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's, it, technically, it's quite difficult, but it's a very simple concept. So this is, this is a single, single fertilised embryo. And the process just involves injecting DNA into into the nucleus of the sperm and then we transfer this embryo back into back into a female mouse so this so this injection needle this injection pipette here is injecting these cells which are embryonic stem cells and these have been modified and a gene's been removed from these and and you actually do this in a cell culture dish and you can remove genes from it you can add genes to it but it's a much more targeted way so you know specifically what you're doing with these cell type again we inject these into an embryo this embryo gets transferred into into um, a female mouse, and when, and when they litter down, there are mice that, that are lacking the gene in question. We use them for looking for gene expression, so if you're not sure where a gene is made, if you're not sure of the cell type a gene is made, then you can tag that gene with something that will show it up. And this is, this is a picture of an embryonic lung, and there are specific cell types here that, that nobody was sure where this gene was expressed properly, and also that they weren't sure when... when um, there was disease models for this, how that was affecting the gene expression. So you can use these animals to kind of really highlight and show up specific cells. You can use it for gene function. So we have a look, see what genes are doing. And this is, this is something called an optokinetic drum. And the mouse sits on this little platform and, and the, uh, the lines rotate around it and the mouse follows it through its head. And then, the, and then the lines decrease and decrease until the mouse no longer follows it. And that's the level of the mouse's eyesight. So this is a way of measuring whether, how, how much mice can see or not. You can also measure disease progression, and that's something that's very difficult in human studies. This is a, a special kind of x-ray machine that's measuring bone density. So if we know that the, an animal's likely to get osteoporosis, then we can measure that from a very early age. Whereas humans, you only know when they, when they have osteoporosis, so it's very difficult to work out what early indicators are, or what early indicators are for, for early intervention for medicines. And also, ultimately, and Paul's going to talk to you a bit about, we're striving towards treatments and we can use some of these disease models for doing proof of concept and, and, for, doing, and for testing potential drug therapies. And so just a summary before I hand you over to Paul to give you some real examples. Mice as a model organism are important because we can control the things that we can't control in humans. So we can control their genetic background, we can control the environment they're bred in and they're kept in. 
and also we can alter specifically alter um, individual genes um, and that's this has been the revolution in transgenic mice or genetically modified mice so I'm now going to hand you over to Paul who's going to who's going to give you some more sort of laboratory examples of how we use these